it's a real treat to have as our guest today um, someone who is no stranger yeah. to this crowd, uh, yeah. Earl Lewis, president of the Mellon Foundation. Uh, Earl, this is very familiar turf to you. We've never been in this hotel, but you've seen um, many of these people many times. You came and spoke to us uh, in 2014 I did. as our luncheon speaker. And um, I'm sure answered your here um, to the roll call uh, for many of the eight years that you were on the ACLS board. And of course, Earl was elected president, a uh, chair of the ACLS board in 2012, but then got a better offer from the Mellon Foundation <laughs> and decided to take that. Um, I don't know why, but I'm glad you did. Um, and um, we're happy to have you here. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could start with a personal question. Sure. Um, Rereading your bio, I know that we both spent time at the University of Minnesota, but you started out as an undergraduate at an evangelical Lutheran college, Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. And I just wondered if you might tell us how you, a guy from Tidewater, Virginia, ended up there. So I used to answer <laughs> this question in an indirect way for about 40 years. I, <laughs> I would say it was something metaphysical. metaphysical. And, but, yeah, but um, there was some event in the previous life that I was trying to conclude in this life, and it took me from Norfolk, Virginia to Moorhead, Minnesota. Okay. And there is no straight line otherwise. Uh, but after listening to Freeman, I, I realized there's partly a story. So I part of what I refer to as a transitional generation. And those individuals who grew up in the segregated South, who went to school, segregated schools until the 10th grade. And then I was part of that first cluster of students who, uh, I would say, massively uh, desegregated uh, schools in Virginia uh, circa 1970-71. Uh, when the time, it was time to go to college, uh, most of my classmates uh, who were white were going to the University of Virginia. And I had decided I'd already done that. Uh, and so I did not want to re-experience desegregating uh, a learning environment uh, in my native Virginia. So I decided to go someplace that I knew nothing about. Uh, and in fact, I came home after my first semester, uh, and this is <laughs> suggests something about a level of ignorance, uh, going, there, must, there, there have to be Lutherans in Norfolk. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> And because I, you know, growing up where I did, um, synagogues and, and Catholic churches and Methodists and Episcopalians and Presbyterians, but I realized I had never encountered a Lutheran until I moved to Minnesota. Uh, and, and so I came home after my first semester and opened the Yellow Pages uh, and went down the list to see there was a Lutheran church uh, that actually I had passed uh, for all of my life, but I had never paid any attention to. Uh, and it was that way of recognizing that in some ways going back to seeing and not observing and that you can be part of an overall environment and yet uh, still be blinded uh, by the things before you. And that actually served as a powerful lesson uh, about moving uh, from the comfort zone of Virginia uh, to the unknown of Minnesota uh, to actually experience something different. But you got a good liberal arts education. I indeed, and in fact, after I leave here, I'm hopping on a plane and flying to Fargo Moorhead because I'm now vice chair of the board. Uh, and so uh, I reminded them in 1976, I and another group of black students went on strike uh, to try to get the college to change its ways. Uh, and they repaid me by now making me vice chair of the board. <laughs> <laughs> no good turn. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I mean, it's one of those interesting questions, and I think we all face this as we think about how do you create change inside of institutions like colleges and universities. I'm reminded, uh, even back in the 1970s, when colleges and universities began to admit in greater numbers uh, students of color, particularly African American students, they expect that the students to come and be changed by that learning experience. And indeed, we were. We came in, however, and in due course had a second expectation that the college and the university also would change. And oftentimes, there's a conflict. And 40 years later to the day, we realize that that conflict still continues to play itself out on campuses across this nation, where we expect the students to change, and the students are often expecting us to change as well. That's true. Um, you certainly outlined um, why we have to think of both continuity and change yes. uh, in thinking about every act field of action in, in which we're engaged. Um, and since this is a humanities crowd, I wonder if we could uh, talk specifically about the humanities um, and, and ask uh, 
you to answer the perennial question of the humanities. Well, what is, where are we going? Um, I don't know, you know, you certainly from the, your perch at Mellon, you, you must hear a lot about the, sure. uh, both the, the aspirations and the frustrations of humanists. Um, you, I think, heard the tail end of most of our panel I today, did. and that may have given you some ideas about how to answer this question, but. Uh, you know, I, I travel enough um, going to different campuses and meetings uh, like these, uh, like this meeting, and I'm reminded that if we're talking about the humanities at the individual level, they're vibrant. I mean, as we heard earlier on, there are new critical questions that are being uh, posed, new ways and new insights that come from doing the work of scholarship. And, and then you began to hear the other side of the story about the humanities in crisis. And so uh, every time I, I get worried there, I go back to the Humanities Indicators Project and, and look at, at, at trend lines uh, and realize that the number of total degrees uh, earned by humanists actually has been on a rise uh, since the 1960s. There was a dip in the 70s. Uh, and in fact, we're now still producing uh, more humanities majors uh, than we did at that low point in the 70s, even as a share of overall degrees. 1987 is one point in time. 2014, I think, is the last piece from the humanities indicators. And it's roughly the same percentage of the share of degrees. And so, and then you go to individual campuses and uh, the story varies there as well. And so what I ended up coming, usually people ask me, am I optimistic? And I end up saying, no, I'm hopeful. Uh, hopeful means that we have to be attentive uh, to, the, uh, to change and what's necessary to make sure that the humanities remain uh, important and vibrant. And I know at the foundation we spent some time thinking about this, uh, in, including um, modifying our the range of grantees that we supported. Uh, we now do things that perhaps five years ago we couldn't have imagined that we would do. Can you give us some examples? Sure. We have <laughs> mounted new partnerships between community colleges and four-year institutions. The old articulation agreements we actually thought were useful, but not necessarily the best ways. And so part of our data has shown that in many uh, universities, uh, upwards of 40% of the students who end up majoring in the humanities started at two-year institutions. And so if you sort of think of what that means, then we have to figure out new ways of making sure there are clear relationships between the two-year institutions and the four-year institutions. We haven't yet crafted a 50-state strategy, but we're getting close to an eight-region strategy where we have uh, grants uh, to Cuyahoga Community College and Case Western, uh, to the community college system uh, in and around San Diego and the University of California in San Diego. Uh, we have some proposed this uh, time around that may uh, connect uh, parts of uh, South Florida and institutions there. We've done it in New, Ma New Hampshire. And so as we began to sort of think, that's a new possibility for us. And as we think about why it's not just students going from two-year institutions to four-year institutions, but relationships then between uh, faculty at the universities oftentimes uh, and those two-year institutions that we've also been able to knit together through some of these grants. So that's one area. Mm -hmm. uh, the other area is one that I'm actually excited about uh, has to do uh, with universities that have attacked the, the whole question of the carceral state uh, in an old way, but in a new way. I mean, the old way was, is if you think back to the 1960s and 70s, uh, we still believe the prisons uh, were to help reform uh, and not just punitive. Uh, and then by the mid-1980s, more and more states have begun to uh, take away prison education as an option. And so we were warehousing individuals rather than thinking about educating them. The data uh, completely show that recidivism uh, decreases uh, when you think about educating. And educating is different than training. And so uh, we have begun to support grants then with universities and that are working uh, to um, help prisoners uh, receive the education that's necessary uh, so that uh, they can indeed be those viable uh, members of society, the citizens that Freeman talked about earlier. Great. You, uh, in your annual report, I think it was 2015, wrote that the grander the human challenge, the more important is the perspective of humanists and artists. Yeah. Um, and we've talked earlier today about um, the many ways in which clearly, and this was last night as well, with the perspectives, the the insights of the humanities do illuminate um, issues that are of absolutely fundamental importance today. Um, 
this sometimes elicits concerns that, well, but what about the intrinsic value of the humanities themselves? And, and this is an old yeah. uh, binary that, I, that I'd hoped we put to rest, but it, it keeps popping up. And I just wondered what you might want to say about that. I, I, it is an old binary, and it probably will never be put to rest as long as we're engaged in, in asking questions and, and taking a critical um, look at what it means to be not only in the academy, but in the broader society. But typically, I ended up answering this by going back to the point I was trying to make, that I can give you scores of examples uh, where um, teams of scholars from one area began to look at a problem or an opportunity and deciphered it incompletely because they lacked the perspective that come from the humanities. And one of the talks I give, one of my favorite examples, um, years ago when I was provost at Emory, I was sitting in a meeting over actually at Georgia Tech, and we had colleagues from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, in the meeting, including one of his former heads. And they were telling the story of this well had, that had been dug uh, in this West African village because the river was contaminated. And the World Bank, or the IMF, and I forget which one, had given monies to a group of engineers to come and dig this well. And they dug the well. And then um, the women looked at the well and kept walking to the river. And, and the engineers were scratching their heads trying to figure out why the women were walking to the river, even though they knew there was fresh, clean water right there. So they finally brought in uh, two gender aspects and an anthropologist uh, and added to the team to actually spend some time talking to the women. And the women then went on to say, look, we understand that the water in the village that's in this well may be cleaner than the water in the river, but you don't understand the social function of actually going to get the water. And it removes us from the immediacy of our children and the household economy. It gives us a time to socialize we want clean water. We just didn't want clean water sitting right there in the middle of, of the village. We needed water someplace else. And so I mean, this serves as actually an interesting example, right, of you put together a team of smart people. They think they've diagnosed a problem, but they've diagnosed it incompletely. You come up with the wrong solution, and then you puzzle. And, and for me, this is sort of a stands for a lot of examples of the work that we are about. And so I mean, I'll give a, a, another example. If I have a great worry about the future of the next 20 to 25 years, it's actually about the, um, not artificial intelligence in the ways that most people think about artificial intelligence, but automation in and of itself can actually lead, I believe, has the potential of producing a new group of unemployed. And so if you go back to a recent study that Tony Carnivale produced just around the election, and where Tony noted that of the 11.6 million people who actually have gained new jobs since the Great Recession, 8.6 of them had a bachelor's degree or higher. Three million had at least some college. Only 80,000 went to individuals with a high school degree or less. Just think about that. Only 80,000 went to individuals with a high school degree or less. And so his piece is the sort of the, the educational have and have nots and what that means for our society going forward. We know right now that uh, upwards of somewhere between three and a half to eight million people who work in the long distance trucking industry will lose their jobs uh, in the next 10 years because no one is debating whether we're gonna have autonomous vehicles. It's only whether it's gonna come in the front end of that next 10 years or the back end, but we will. Those are eight and a half million people who have working middle class jobs. There's a talk of universal wage and what that can introduce and, and the implications. But I think it's humanists need to be in a conversation about something old-fashioned but important called the dignity of work. And how do we understand that? How do we begin to actually work on and begin to shape a conversation about not how people work, but why they work and what that means then for them individually and in society? I mean, these examples then suggest that it's not an either or. The exploration of a singular study that's really your passion is very, very important because it also contributes to the body of knowledge that may influence. But there are other questions that require additional perspectives, and humanists need to be there. And I believe that more and more as I travel the country and, and travel the world. Can you imagine how that kind of conversation could actually be facilitated? I can imagine it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Up to somebody to propose how to. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think this is a case where part of it is owning it. 
right? And so someone saying that, I mean, in the example of the, the village in West Africa is to make it clear to the IMF and the World Bank and others that uh, assembling a team uh, dealing with complex problems means that you need to have a diverse set of players. Uh, and, and there's a whole body of scholarship there. In fact, the, um, we, as some of you know, have committed to uh, producing this series called Our Compelling Interests, The Value of Diversity uh, for a Prosperous Democracy. Uh, the second volume in that series will be by Scott Page, and that links what he refers to as the diversity bonus. What happens when you, the more complex the problem, the more diverse the team of actors are there in many different settings. And for those of you who know Scott, uh, he's a social scientist and a mathematician, so he has enough formulas and, and examples to prove how this works in different settings. But that's, that's one piece. But it's also the other part then is also saying what are the two or three or four critical questions? I mean, because it may not be that one wants to propose 15 problems to be solved but one or two or three. And I think that from those of us who sit at foundations uh, to uh, the various federal agencies that have survived at least through the Omnibus uh, Bill uh, and, and others, that uh, there are key questions that require this kind of new approach uh, to, to scholarship. I, I've said to, uh, in the past, the folks in the Obama administration, uh, that uh, <clears throat> if you're gonna study the human brain, and since there was all this work on the human brain, there's no way to study the human brain without actually uh, talking about how it works with real people. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and a very unusual idea. And there are humanities-based lab settings for that kind of work. I mean, the archives, and I think I may have even said this in 2014 when I was here. I mean, just think of it at, at a place like Emory when Emory acquired Simon Rushdie's papers. They also acquired his uh, computers. And so you can begin to map out creativity uh, in a certain kind of way by actually overlying, laying the sort of computer networking of it all with the notations. But a computer scientist can't do that alone. It requires a team of scholars thinking in new ways about how we tackle complex problems. Right. Well, you just mentioned um, the federal government. And yeah. We're just a hop skipping away. I'll, I'll ask a question, which. I think will not come as a surprising one. I, when the news of the um, intention to abolish the NEH came up, I think I'm sure you were not the only person who was who heard. Well, the Mellon Foundation is going to have to come in and save us. Yes. Um, <laughs> and not that you're not already a major source of, of life support for for many institutions in, in this room. But yeah. um, what you've published a couple of pieces that have uh, responded to that um, plea. Yes, uh, I have. Quite in no uncertain terms, and I wondered if you'd like yeah, to. So, I mean, the most recent one was uh, two days ago. Um, but my short answer is no. Um, that's not our job. And so going back, in, in 1980, 81, as you may recall, President Reagan uh, proposed uh, eliminating NEA and NEH. And then there was a bipartisan uh, committee that was co-chaired by Charlton Heston and Hannah Gray uh, that uh, produced uh, a task force report that, yeah, unlikely do, all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, as part of that, they ended up producing this uh, document that's essentially a compact, arguing that the um, nation's interests are served best when there is a public and private alliance promoting the arts and, and culture uh, and the humanities. And, and that document has stood for the last 35 years. I still think that document and its thesis is still salient uh, and it makes sense for us. I wrote in a piece that is on uh, the website for uh, the Mellon Foundation uh, a couple of days ago that NEH does things that we can't do and we shouldn't do. Uh, and so if you look at their place across uh, the nation and the number of states they touch and the number of communities, that's not what a private foundation does in the same way. It is actually our ability to work in, in partnership uh, that actually aids and advances, in my view, uh, the place of the arts and the humanities in American life. The notion that somehow we should step in I think it's a dangerous proposition uh, for civil society, and particularly for our society, that only private funding. I mean, and it goes back to this notion that there's only a private good and there's not a public good. And I actually would like to argue and strenuously believe that uh, NEH and NEA represents the public good. 
that comes from being able to support scholars, to support programs, to uh, generate new ways of learning and thinking about communities. And, and, and then we can do other things. I mean, so, and it's not either or. I, and been giving a series of talks over the last uh, little bit, we ended up underwriting uh, at the Mellon Foundation, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival's program, sort of a history cycle. Uh, and among the people who are playwrights was Lynn Nottage. I mean, some of you may have seen, and that Lynn just won the people surprised for her play Sweat, and some of you may have seen Sweat, which is an incredible examination of deindustrialization and uh, in, in Reading, Pennsylvania. I and mean, we can do that, but we can't do all the other pieces that go with then taking some parts of that into Reading and working with those communities in the same kind of way. Those are uh, ways in which I actually think is, is uh, short-sighted. Uh, to argue that private philanthropy should be the only answer. And, and I worry sometimes because we in private philanthropy sometimes hold us up, hold ourselves up as providing the answers. And so, I mean, I have to say there are days when I cringe uh, when I read an announcement from a brother or sister foundation and they promote their good work as if their good work uh, is the only good work. And I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's been interesting that you've all, but you've engaged in partnerships. You yourself yeah. have engaged with partnerships with NEH. That no, very... we engage with, in partnerships with NEH, uh, with NEA uh, as well. Uh, we uh, underwrote uh, with 15 other foundations um, an entity called Art Place to talk about the relationship between um, social and economic development and creative placemaking, uh, which was uh, generated in this case by NEA rather than, than NEH when Rocco Lindemann was still the uh, head of NEA. I mean, it's this idea, how do we actually begin to think we have one set of resources, they have another another, but together, uh, one plus one can actually equal three in a new form of math. Yeah. You just spoke of the public good, and, and um, I know one of the planks, another plank of the foundation strategic plan is to provide support for faculty and student work in the public humanities. And yeah. I, I have to say that um, even in our research fellowship program, we're seeing more and more proposals that incorporate some kind of public dimension, and we heard our fellows today, obviously, um, keenly intent on doing that as well. What, is, what, do the pub, what does the phrase public humanities mean to you? I'm smiling because I just gave a talk on, um, looking down at Jonathan, uh, at Cornell and talking about the public humanities uh, there. I mean, I think part of it is, is uh, it has more than one definition. I mean, and, and that's that's the challenge of trying to synthesize it. I mean, so there's the ways in which we take the the knowledge and uh, the research uh, and, and the arguments that we have developed and share them with beyond the academic publics that we are trained uh, to work with. And sometimes then that's through the use of digital tools. Uh, and so we'll make either films or we'll make other kinds of products and that allow us to then have this migrate out, migrate out into a whole set of, of other kinds of publics. In other cases, it's actually taking an idea and trying to figure out then how do you center that idea uh, and across a, a variety of spaces. We had a convening at the foundation back in, uh, actually the day before the election uh, and, and about slavery. And so as some of you know, uh, we are uh, rapidly approaching uh, 2019, uh, the 400th anniversary of the importation of the first African peoples into Jamestown that will subsequently lead to the introduction of, of the systems of slavery uh, that uh, came to define America for 250 years. And so the, what we realize here is that uh, there was a version of the public humanities talking to people around the room but it's not a coordinated version. And so the public theater will actually produce a play by Suzanne Laurie Parks, and it becomes a story about the public humanities. The New York Historical Society will have an exhibit, uh, and, uh, and they will have a piece about the public humanities. And so the second for us, and it can go on, the challenge for us as we think about it, are there ways of stitching these together as we move forward, where it's more than the individual aggregate, aggregation of uh, programs at one place to say there are broad themes and topics and that should be explored for X number of years by integrated uh, group of uh, actors uh, to help shape and improve an understanding. And that's another piece as we're sort of begun to evolve our notions of the public humanities at the foundation. And in, in that case, it becomes part of the overall strategic activity. 
And of course, we consider our Mellon-funded yes. public fellows program another way of, of um, advancing the goal of getting humanists out in the public. Well, I mean, I was reminded of this as a, I, at that point, relatively young associate professor at, at Michigan back in the late 80s, early 90s, where I had a handful of students who would come to me and they would say, you know, Earl, I'm not sure I want to finish my PhD. And I say, why? They say, because the work I want to do is to uh, speak to more than just my colleagues and, and, and others. How do I begin to think about this? And I perhaps crassly, I would say to them, I said, to be honest, uh, Dr. So-and-so before your name would get more people to pay attention to you than just so-and-so before your name. Uh, and so this think about this uh, as a tactic, it's not an overall strategy for being able to get to where you want. But it's to say that for the last 30 years, at the very least, we also have been educating a generation of young academics who believe that the work and their work actually can speak to the communities that they are part of. And that indeed, if the work doesn't speak to that community, the work may not fully fulfill them in the ways that they want to be fulfilled. And it's this interesting challenge in part because um, I was in a conversation with a liberal arts college president who was being uh, pushed by a board member. Uh, in the last uh, few days uh, about uh, business and, and how colleges need to be more like businesses. And I said to him, I said, do, do a simple test. Go back to the founding of your college and figure out the businesses that were in your community when you were there, when you were founded. And then plot it over the last 125 years and see how many of those businesses still exist. <laughs> and, and how many of them actually have actually uh, contributed in the same way. Uh, and there, but is that part too uh, being able to then take the knowledge of uh, the academy and inform the public in a new kind of way about why colleges and universities actually redound to the benefit of their communities because most of them aren't going away. They are indeed anchor institutions. Now, I know that in addition to your job as president of the Mellon Foundation and yeah. numerous other nonprofits that you serve, you've agreed to become the president or you're elected to the presidency of the Organization of American Historians, um, one of our learned societies. Yes. How, do you, how do you see the learned societies um, playing into your yeah. hopes for the humanities? I think they're critical. And in part, and Kathy's here somewhere, uh, at least she was, uh, and, but there's a way in which so much of what we do is to begin, in the case of the OEH, is to tell America's story uh, and to deal with the contradictions. So we just had our meeting in New Orleans uh, a few weeks ago, and I went on a tour, right? I went on a tour, the, uh, the Black History Tour of New Orleans. Uh, and um, one of the people who gave me the tour was a guy, Malcolm Huber. Now, some of you may have seen Malcolm because he was on the front page of the New York Times, uh, or at least the electronic version. Um, three days ago, uh, when New Orleans elected uh, to take down uh, some of the Confederate statues. Think of what then the Organization of American Historians can do. I Me, mean, in this case, Mitch Landrieu and uh, folks in New Orleans trying to figure out how do we think about memory? How do we deal with statues and the ways in which they tell you one part of a story, but it's a contested view of that story? And how do you, what do you, how do you begin to then tell the other part? I mean, some would say, just remove the statues. And I talked to some people in New Orleans and said, just remove them. Others say, no, don't tear them down. Put them uh, someplace else. And it becomes a graveyard for old Confederate statues. <laughs> Others said, no, don't do that. Actually. Um, leave them where they are and put up a new name as a way to contest uh, the space. But here's where I think, in, the, in our case, the OEH becomes a critical player because as a learned society, there are scholars there who have studied this and from not only the context of New Orleans and the South, but from various other uh, perspectives, the Vietnam Memorial uh, to others can help them inform a conversation and help, in this case, I know the mayor of New Orleans is looking for someone to help him put this all in context as he's actually dealing with uh, the battles over whose version of history matters the most. And, and you think, of, I mean, talking about contested space, I, I, um, one member of my staff's son has been going to this event every day and writing poems and stories about standing next to the guy with the, wrapped in the Confederate flag with the AK-47. 
uh, and trying to figure out, I mean, what is space and what is safe space? I mean, and whose memories and whose version of history matters the most? That, for me, is one part of what a learned society can do. That's in the immediate and now. The other part is actually to uh, say to the next generation of young people, let alone those of us who have been in the profession for a long, long time, that the questions that we frame, the ways in which we frame them, actually make a difference in the ways in which we understand who we are as a nation uh, or, or as a society. And that in a world where um, we know that in this country, I mean, it's an interesting thing about, right? So by 2044, we'll have a non-white majority. And, and if you imagine um, most of us, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but you know, remember going through uh, primary school and secondary school where you used to be in the stands at the sporting events and we're number one. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in another point in life where you're no longer number one. How do you deal with that? How do you actually begin to sort of shape a, a series of narratives that actually explain it and where um, the whole idea of a common uh, sort of shared culture can actually keep propelling us forward uh, rather than become the fault line that we can never cross? And there again, it becomes where the body of scholarship, the ways in which we frame questions, the ways in which we talk to one another and to others, it becomes a key role uh, for the learned societies. You know, as I walked in on Ellen's uh, talk about death uh, today, and, and I was sort of reminded that these fundamental questions that are centuries in the making help shape our moment. Now, how do we understand then those fundamental questions and how they have evolved and changed over millennia, is certainly, if not centuries. Thank you. It's, it's interesting how <clears throat> the various sessions of this meeting seem to be echoing each other in, yeah. in very powerful ways. I want to thank you for taking on the role of, of president. It's a really in, a crucial one for ACLS, for all of us. I, I don't know whether you need to come to the leadership seminar, where we orient <laughs> presidents to, um, um, to a new leadership role that they're not used to, but you're very welcome to do that. So. I will uh, appreciate the invitation, and, and um, one year I will even show up. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I have a lot more questions, but I want to uh, give our remaining time to the audience, um, who I'm sure um, have been thinking of uh, questions they might like to ask you. And, and, as, um, and since I know so, so many of you, I'll ask you questions if you don't ask me. <laughs> so. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm not sure. Do we have a, oh, we have microphones, right? Uh, thank you. I'm Daphne Lei. I represent American Society for Theater Research. Um, I just want to thank you for mentioning theater. Yes. For mentioning Susan Laurie Parks and yeah. uh, Lynn Nottage and yeah. uh, Shakes, uh, Oregon Shakes and public theater. Because yeah. I think in this age that especially our students, they are hiding behind the screens, yeah. right? So we forget about this kind of live engagement. Like right now, we are engaged yes. as human beings. Yes. And I think for the audience, they have the immediate effect. And then for the actors, they embody whatever story they're going to tell. It's a very vulnerable, but also very brave moment when they're on yeah. stage. So I just want to thank you for, for mentioning that. And I want us to remember that theater is always a tool for us to think about public humanities. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, thank you for, for the observation. I was reminded of this, and so I, I don't think Oscar would mind me saying this. So Oscar Eustace, who's the artistic di director at the Public Theater, uh, said that um, after the election and realizing uh, this notion of a divided America, uh, the sweat cast went to Reading, and they performed a play. 800 people, I guess. It's free. First come, first serve. Uh, they didn't bring the props. But then they had an opportunity for the members of the community to not only talk to the actors, but to talk to one another. And they think of the 
former mill workers working with the former employers uh, and talking about the choreography of the old cycle. I mean, I'm an American labor historian of sorts as well at Another Life. And so this notion that you know, workers uh, would strike for a contract, the mills would bring in at various times replacement workers of different racial ethnic backgrounds. They would go through a process, but then there would be a compromise and a new contract would be formed only to get to 2000. Uh, and there were macroeconomic changes uh, that would shift then the locational work. Theater created a space for people to talk to one another. Great. Any other questions? There's one right there. Okay, thank you. So, so I'm curious, what sort of legacy or influence, if any, is there of the Mellon family on the work of the Mellon Foundation? Um, there are... <laughs> um, it, so if you come into our boardroom, uh, there are portraits of uh, Paul Mellon and Elsa Mellon Bruce. And so for those of you who don't know the history, the foundation was formed in 1969. It was the merger of the Avalon Foundation and the Old Dominion Foundation. Uh, Paul and, Al uh, and Elsa merged their two separate foundations and renamed it for their father, Andrew. And uh, since that time, uh, it came with 300, about $300 million in 1969. Uh, Elsa would die in an accident a couple of years later. Another 300 would come in. Uh, so it was about $600 uh, million when it was capitalized fully in about 1972. Uh, Paul was on the board uh, during his uh, life, and uh, his son, Tim Ellen, was on the board uh, for a number of years thereafter. Uh, there are no members of the family on the board uh, at this particular point in time. And, and, uh, but through... But Paul still lives in a certain kind of way uh, there. Um, and, you know, in that Faulkner line, uh, the past is never the past, uh, in, in a way. We are reminded of his vision uh, that the old notion is that you identify able people uh, from venerable institutions, uh, give them the resources to do their work and get out of the way. We modified that a little bit. It's been updated. Uh, we've expanded the number of venerable institutions. Uh, but some part that thesis still animates then the ways in which we go about our work. And that's actually very critical. Uh, and, but um, it's a self-perpetuating board uh, as they... Uh, as they are these days, and so as uh, the case with the Ford Foundation, there are no members of the Ford family on the Ford Foundation board, which I suspect Darren said last year, uh, at this moment we have no Mellon family members on the board. And then our lives are complicated because there's more than one Mellon family and there's more than one Mellon Foundation, and so we always have to explain to people that we're the New York branch of the family and not the Pittsburgh branch of the family. Earl, Craig Clafter with the American Society for Legal History. One of the challenges, as you know, for humanities research is that it's not particularly well suited to being assessed by scientists and statisticians. Yeah. As the Mellon Foundation is one of the principal funders of humanities research, how do you go about measuring the success of your investments in humanities research? That's a very good question, and I would say, um, is a work in progress uh, in the sense that if you leave it only to the metrics and trying to figure out what's the impact, uh, and, and I have to remind myself, so much of contemporary philanthropy, is, and it may be true of the past as well, but certainly over the last 10 to 15 years, we measure things in one to three year increments, uh, which is sort of the effects of a grant. And what we try to remind ourselves is sometimes we're engaged in field change and it may actually take a generation for that field to change. And a generation, in our case, is not a digital generation, which is 18 months, uh, but it's an old analog generation, which is about 20, 25 years. And so the question for us is, do we always have the patience uh, to actually allow that kind of change uh, to occur over uh, a period of time? And we're having lively debates, uh, even inside of the foundation at this moment, as to how we then marry both quantitative and qualitative assessments uh, in such a way that we can see uh, impact. So the three things we normally do is whether or not um, an idea that starts at one place actually sort of germinates and grows and others actually take it up. That's one way of showing that there's some then movement and is beginning to uh, shape a, a field. 
uh, there are ways in which the academy in and of itself then verifies this by our peer assessments when we bring in people for assessing everything from the Sawyer seminars uh, to the new directions and others that are beginning to say, here are new questions that are on the table, new ways of thinking about it. Uh, this is important. And in the third way, and we're not unlike uh, those of you in the academy, we pay attention uh, to the ways in which the community itself receives this new approach and whether in some cases they garner other attention, awards and recognition, citations uh, as a way to say it's beginning to take root uh, in a way rather than the number of citations per uh, per entry, uh, which is uh, typical in certain members of the scientists at the very least. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, Jay Malone, History of Science Society. Uh, my members and I think that science is one of the highest expressions of the humanities. And I was wondering uh, if you could share your thoughts about how we could bring more scientists and engineers into the humanities tent. Okay. Um, that's a hard question to answer, I mean, in the abstract. And I actually think that given the way that particularly much of the science is directed toward problem solving and an identifiable question and problem to be solved, then one way to do it is actually imagine, can you answer that question alone? Or do you actually need uh, in the colleagues from a different set of uh, disciplinary backgrounds to help you fully answer that question? I, 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 can, I can give an example. Um, I can give a couple of examples. But let's use, let's use water, right? I mean, uh, water fascinates me. Uh, maybe because I grew up on the coast of Virginia uh, and, um, and there was always water and I was born in Norfolk, which is sinking into uh, the river and into the ocean. Uh, and so I'm fascinated by water. But I went to school then in North Dakota, on the North Dakota-Minnesota border, the Red River, which floods almost every year. Uh, and then I was looking at an image um, about eight years ago, not, maybe 10 years ago, uh, where St. Louis was flooding. And there was this Amish farmer uh, who was wearing his traditional garb, but who was using sandbags to hold back the water. And I happened to have had a, a book, a Mark Twain novel uh, on my desk at the time, and I'm thinking, why are we using 19th century technologies in the 21st century? Uh, and, and what is that about? And so I started asking some engineers, don't we have pumps that are powerful enough to move millions of gallons of water uh, in rapid succession? And they said yes. And so going around, I realized then it was not necessarily fully a technical question. So then I went to some public policy people saying, um, if we know it's going to flood, and we know usually days ahead it's going to flood, and we know there are drought-stricken areas, why can't we come up with a public policy that allows us, and this requires then a whole new story about the narrative of, of, of who owns the water and who should have the rights to the water it started to emerge there. And I said, well, we figured this out with natural gas along the eastern seaboard. We figured out a way to move natural gas across state boundaries and to regulate that in such a way in that uh, someone is paying for this transit uh, and all. Can't we figure this out with water? And that became an example, in my view, uh, of a question that the technologists and the engineers had a partial answer to. The public policy people had another piece of the answer to. Uh, folks in political science had an element to, but there's also something about the narrative we sh has written and constructed about, in this case, a different version of states' rights. And how do we begin to understand that? And how do we begin to actually put together the right teams to be able to tackle this problem so that we aren't deploying 19th century technology for a 21st century situation? And your earlier example of the women... Yeah, in the, in the, in the well. Uh, yeah, yeah, also about water, I think, yeah. illustrates the same... Um, importance of uh, humanistic understanding exactly. and uh, solving problems. Well, and, and I was struck, because I, I won't name the former members of Congress, but I, I was struck by uh, asking, using the water example, and asked a longtime member of Congress um, about infrastructure. 
Uh, and I said, can't we agree on infrastructure and, and that we should, as a nation, figure out a way uh, to repair our crumbling bridges and decaying roads? Uh, uh, and I live in New York. And if anyone here from New York, I mean, the subways haven't worked for the last week. I mean, not last week, last four weeks. The, the signals keep going in and out and, and uh, huge and long delays, let alone was Penn Station was underwater last week. Uh, and, 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 and so this congressperson said to me, Earl, we can agree on it. He says, on both sides of the aisle, we can agree on it. In the old days, we could not only agree on it, we also could figure out who would get credit. He says, we've now gotten to the point where we can agree on this, the problem, agree on the solution. We can't agree on who gets credit. And I thought, that's an interesting moment to begin to think a humanistic analysis of why is it? And that we can't agree at this moment on who would get credit. And as a result, we find ourselves stalling on public policy issues that are critical to the nation's, nation's future. Nicola, I think you. Yeah. Earl, hi. Nicola hi there. Courtright, board member. So this is an unfair question, and I'm happy if you just go in another direction without signaling that you are going in another <laughs> okay. direction. But what would you say is the kind of funding that Mellon or let's say other organizations do that creates the biggest shift in people's minds or the greatest changes in society that are for the good? What kinds yeah. of funding does that? I think it's funding that, there are three types of funding, I think. One, funding uh, where you aren't being measured by output uh, in a one to three year cycle. I mean, I had a critique of philanthropy before I got to sit in this seat, and one day it may drive me out of this seat. Uh, but um, that impact philanthropy has certain virtues, but there are some questions that actually don't lend themselves to a short horizon. And I think part of being able to figure out within the overall ecosystem what things actually lend themselves to short horizons and those kinds of questions versus ones that actually take 10 years. And I think that's actually critical. Linked to that is the idea that at its best, philanthropy is venture capital, all right? We're taking a bet on a moment or an opportunity, recognizing that not all of it will pay off. What I worry about sometimes is that like the rest of the nation, those of us in philanthropy are, are um, less willing to engage in a certain kind of venture capital. Uh, and, and hence, want to go back to the question of assessing return, trying to figure out what's the ROI. Uh, and, and that may not be the right way to actually phrase the question. Uh, and I think the, the third part is then engaging in some products and projects that are not dependent upon any one foundation or, or philanthropic interest. I mean, some of you know, I mean, I think we're now over 100,000 registered philanthropies uh, in the United States. I mean, and so individuals, I mean, I, as a fun thing, one time I looked to see how many philanthropies were just in the zip code 10065, which is where the Mellon Foundation is located. Uh, and a few years ago, there were well over 900. My guess is now we're probably at 1,100. Uh, and so there's this impulse around the nation for people to set up new kinds of philanthropies uh, and uh, want to do, to do good. The question is sometimes, um, you get a bigger lift if you aggregate uh, and people come together to work in common on a set of opportunities rather than just a single individual family foundation, private foundation, et cetera, trying to work on those problems uh, and, or, or opportunities. And I think that in, is where for us at Mellon as part of our street to plan is also trying to figure out how do we find the right partners? Uh, I mean, Pauline raised a question about the Mellon Foundation uh, and its role in supporting the arts and the humanities. As I used to say to my colleagues all the time, we would love more company. Uh, any more questions? We have time maybe for one more. Or maybe Earl, you get to ask one question. <laughs> well, I mean, the, as you think through, I mean, and I look uh, at the 
there's a political rhetoric, right, about the arts and humanities, and there's a symbolic rhetoric uh, that went with the idea that we were zero out NEA, NEA, the Institute for Museums and Library Studies, uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and you sort of go down the line, Legal Services Corporation and all. But as you sit in your communities, I mean, one of the questions I guess that I'm always wrestling with, how do you explain to your neighbors why those entities are important, not only for you and your work, but for the nation as a whole. I mean, what, what do you say in the grocery store or somewhere else in your community where you're folks who aren't necessarily always academics or engaged with learned societies and where these are critical questions and, and all? Because I, I think part of our challenge is, is that how we began to explain what's important one at a time sometimes becomes that kind of cacophony and that begins to sort of generate a new understanding of, of where we are. And I leave that not as a rhetorical question and not for anyone necessarily to answer here now, but it's certainly something we're, we're thinking about at, at the foundation. Uh, how do we... How do we make sure that uh, the passage of the omnibus bill or the uh, what well may happen next uh, cycle is not the last story about the role that the arts and humanities and culture play in American life and have to play uh, in American life? Freeman quoted uh, from the heart of the matter I me mean, as a starting point uh, for his talk over lunch, and one's reminded uh, in a way that those kinds of public statements and statements of affirmation are important. But I'm also reminded that we read them, but next door neighbors may not. And how do we begin to translate what we read to next door neighbors? That's an opportunity. And I think this goes back to the learned societies. I actually believe more than ever before um, we may have to imagine our audience is not only uh, those of us who are parts of our guild, uh, but our next door neighbors. Thank you. I'm going to let you take that home as, as homework. <laughs> um, and everybody needs to turn in a paper which answers that question yeah. uh, tomorrow morning. But um, thank you, Earl. Um, it's been great to have you here. I hope you'll come back again. And. Uh, I hope you'll join me in, in expressing our appreciation.